to be like this for some time. So um, we'll we'll um, persist and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to hand over to Iman in a moment. I'll get Iman to uh, introduce the the group of speakers that we have tonight and and the topic. But I always like to say thank you to Iman and Agile Analytics for for sponsoring the user group. Um, Iman's the um, he's actually the brains behind the user group. So Iman phoned me and said, "Why don't we do a user group?" Uh, I, I say this every every six to twelve months. Iman, is it coming out for five years in October? I think, so. I, think it, yeah. I think it was pretty close to five years. So uh, anyway, it's it's been a fun long journey, and um, and yeah. So thanks for your support, uh, Iman, in making this happen. Um, I might hand over to you, get you to introduce uh, our speakers for tonight and the topic. And, and then we'll get started. As normal, please put any questions that you have in the chat, and then we'll, we'll determine whether we stop during the uh, during the presentation or whether we um, or whether we wait to the end. I guess we'll find that out in a second. Uh, hey, Iman, sorry, I, there was one thing I forgot I was going to do. Um, can I just can I just quickly show this for everyone? Yes. Absolutely. So those of you that know me, um, I'm a DAX guy. I'm a Power BI guy. I've just launched a new training course. You can find it at skillwave.training. So many of you would know that I'm um, a part owner of skillwave.training. And this is the new course, Demystifying DAX. So this is an, an intermediate to advanced course. So this is not a beginner's course. Um, and it's a combination of video on demand plus live Q&A with me over four sessions. And so I've got the first course coming up in uh, about two weeks time from now it's uh, 280 US dollars if you're interested and you can you can find it at skillwave.training and just go to the courses and yeah I'd love to have you come along if you're interested thanks thanks Iman just that word from from my sponsor thanks Matt uh, good, good evening everyone uh, welcome to uh, Power BI meetup tonight we have a I think very good session uh, prepared for this session tonight uh, we have a uh, few of my colleagues and a client who will be presenting about a case study of uh, how we help Tourism Australia to leverage Power BI, Azure and Synapse uh, to become more data driven and so on. So they will explain about the uh, problem and the solution and how it, uh, you know, some lessons learned and things like that. So we have Seamus uh, May from Tourism Australia. Uh, I will let, uh, let them to introduce themselves when they start the session. Uh, Matt, uh, Salman Zade, Kane, uh, and Chad from our uh, team will be also presenting uh, from the technical and business perspective. So as you know, we are Agile Analytics. Uh, you see my screen, uh, Matt? Yeah, Matt? absolutely. Yeah, so I'm new to Zoom. I'm still learning. Uh, we usually use Teams uh, here, but Anyway, Microsoft World Partner in Data Analytics, we help organizations become data-driven with end-to-end -end solutions in data platform and integration, BI and advanced analytics. You may know some of the package uh, solutions that we have in different business functions, and you can ask us if you need help with implementation of those for your organization. So tonight, we also have two free tickets for our next Power BI training, which is next week. So we will uh, do this maybe uh, for the best question or someone, I don't know, maybe we ask question or you ask question, we haven't decided how, but we will have two free tickets uh, uh, for two people uh, tonight. That's it for me. So I'm going to hand over to Matt. Uh, is it, oh yeah, Matt is here. I'm here, yeah. Uh, Iman, I was thinking you're sharing your screen. Do you want uh, to open the presentation or? Do you want me to share the screen? Uh, no, I don't have it ready. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen, sorry. Meet people, so yeah. You, might, you might have to stop sharing in order for Matt to be able to share. Okay, sure, sounds good. And for the new people who just joined, uh, hi again. Uh, we are doing uh, a case study of how we help Tourism Australia and some of the lessons learned. And feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm just going to unshare in a second, stop share. So Matt can start. And maybe you can introduce the team, Matt. Oh, I can sure do that. Um, maybe while I, uh, so sorry, I'm new to Zoom as well. It says, sorry, host is disabled participant sharing screen. 
Ooh. Come on. So I've just emailed you the presentation. I don't know if, if you can figure it out quickly. Oh, sorry. I'm just trying different buttons. Maybe I did the wrong one. Uh, while, while Limon does that, maybe we'll just uh, quickly uh, introduce ourselves. We'll start with Seamus. Hey guys, thanks very much for having me here. Um, I'm the strategic analyst at Tourism Australia. We worked uh, with Agile Analytics for the past six months, I guess, throughout this sort of big project, helping us, um, I guess, consolidate all our data sources into one easy Power BI platform. Thank you, Seamus. Uh, next up, Kane. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm uh, Kane. I'm a senior consultant with Agile. Um, predominantly uh, love working in Power BI and DAX. Um, known for uh, around the place for blogging on uh, topics like calculation groups. Uh, and I built all the uh, the reporting for um, for this project. Well, pr most of the reporting. Thank you, Kane. And Chad. Hi, everyone. Thanks um, for joining in. So my name is Chad. So I've been working for Agile um, as a principal consultant. And my main area of interest is like Azure data engineering and, and uh, advanced analytics side. So I've been, I've been helping Tourism Australia in this particular project, uh, setting up the backend and, and uh, creating the data factory pipelines and, and bringing data from source systems into the data warehouse. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and I'm Matt Samanzade. So I, I looked over the project. Uh, I'm a delivery director for Agile Analytics. I've been with Agile for almost six months now. Uh, time flies. Um, prior to that, my, my experience has been uh, mostly on the customer facing side. So, you know, I've been the head of analytics for a uh, medium sized retail organization. Uh, and prior to that, uh, most of my uh, time was in uh, retail banking. So, one of the big four. Uh, across analytics projects and technology um, roles as well. Um, I think someone is sharing their screen. Is, it, is that I'm Iman? sharing that because I couldn't figure out how to that <laughs> presentation. Yeah. And, and we saw we can... saw your suggestion, Nick, to uh, to move it across to Teams. Maybe maybe for next time. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, uh, can you see? I was, my I was just being cheeky. Couldn't help myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problems. All good. Um, yeah, we can see your screen. Everyone can see the screen. All right, I might I might get you to drive him on because I don't know how to do that. Uh, take oh. control. Sorry, we are we are Microsoft people, Nick. So I'm I'm fairly used to Teams, but not not too much to Zoom. Um, so a couple of things we're going to cover off today. Uh, so uh, obviously intros we've already done that, but uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the solution and the. Uh, the project from the customer lens. So Seamus is actually going to give us a bit of an overview of, you know, why why the project started, uh, what were the kind of things that were considered in actually standing up the project. I'll touch on a little bit on the uh, approach around the project. Um, chat will touch on the solution. Uh, Kane is going to then go through and talk about um, the how how we uh, the actual solution was built from a Power BI's perspective, as well as um, you know, uh, what was the design ethos, you know, and some things around, you know, how we actually developed and deployed. And I'll, I'll uh, wrap it up with some concluding thoughts. Iman, this is an old presentation I just noticed. Did you just okay. pick up the last email that I just sent? Okay, so I need to check that. I, I got this yesterday, but... Uh... No, no, so use, okay. um, use the email I just sent you, sorry. Oh, you just sent me, okay. So uh, I think... Uh, Next time we should use Teams because that's what we, we all We should use Teams, <laughs> definitely. That's that's uh, learning. All right, so that's the latest one. Yep. Yeah. Yes, please. Good. So I go to presentation mode. Yep. Excellent. All right. Cool. And so on that note, I will hand over to Seamus. Uh, Seamus is going to talk to you a little bit about the project, why it was initiated, and uh, you know, obviously, um, from a customer lens, what was the thinking behind the pro the project, Seamus? Oh, thanks, Matt. Um, so I'll give you just a quick background of um, my role at Tourism Australia and I guess what my team does and overall sort of what Tourism Australia is meant to do uh, for the industry. So Tourism Australia is a government agency. We're responsible for um, generating demand uh, from international visitors to Australia. Um, the main focus is, I guess, leisure travellers, so your holiday 
VFR visitors, plus we're also in the sort of the business event space. Um, the organization, us at CA, we're active in 15 key international markets, uh, but since the beginning of last year, so I guess when the borders closed, uh, we entered into the uh, domestic market as well. So our purpose there was to grow demand um, in order to sort of fill that gap of uh, the lack of international visitors. Um, my team is the strategy and research team within TA. So we mainly look after all the strategic insights and research into, I guess, what the attitudes of um, international visitors, what they're looking for in sort of uh, international markets to travel to, um, what other destinations they're looking to go to. I guess we're just monitoring the industry and providing as many insights we can to our marketing team so that campaigns and partnerships are most effective. Um, so as I mentioned before, we, um, we went out to tender because we identified an issue within the department, I guess sort of a capacity issue. We were sort of a very small team of five people. Uh, we managed around 10 different data sources uh, providing um, insights to the company. Um, it, it was a huge range of data sources. I'll go through a bit more detail later. Um, but the outcome was we wanted to increase team efficiency by drawing on insights across a large range of data sources. Um, our main stakeholders within TA's exec team, we have a board, um, a group of board members, employees, and then we also uh, report into a few other government departments. Uh, within external stakeholders, uh, that's sort of the Australian tourism industry overall. So we sort of help, uh, I guess, smaller providers in tourism, um, insights and um, research into what people are looking for and what's changing over time. Uh, try to flip through. Um, so what we were doing previously, a lot of our reporting and visualizations um, of data was done in Excel. So that was sort of my role within TA. I joined TA about 18 months ago, so the start of last year. Um, I, it was already an established role, so I just sort of picked up what was going on there. Um, my background is in analytics, a little bit more, I guess, in Excel. So analysis, uh, forecasting and things like that. I had limited experience in Power BI, but that was an area that I sort of wanted to move into a little bit more and get a bit more exposure. So our previous sort of uh, tools we were using was Excel's, uh, generating PDF reports um, on a, uh, depending on sort of when the data source was released, so monthly, weekly, and then just sort of sending out an email report to the company in terms of what's changing um, insights. Um, I identified that the sort of reporting required sort of 80 hours a month. So it was taking up a bit of time uh, just due to the different data sources we have and the uh, time uh, releases. Um, we weren't really new to Power BI, but our our usage was limited, I guess you could say. So um, we were using Power BI in a few different ways. We had a few Power BI reports on our website. So on Tourism Australia's corporate website, um, just to provide the industry with a bit more data and a bit more insights into who's coming to Australia, how much they're spending, where they're going in particular. Um, but a lot of these reports, I guess all of the reports were sort of just pointed directly to Excel files. So I guess efficiencies wasn't great. And that's sort of an issue we sort of um, noticed as we moved, I guess, from last year about March when the borders closed and COVID hit, we were picking up a lot more data sources just to try and understand what's changing the environment. And we sort of really understood that our capacity within the team was limited to do that. So we needed, without picking up more heads, I guess, more bodies to help the analysis, we needed a, we needed a, an outcome to reporting and to visualize the data. So let's start, we went out to a limited tender, um, invited a, a group of experienced sort of sellers to provide data modeling and reporting services through Power BI. Uh, we're a Microsoft company, so um, all our back end and um, infrastructure is uh, uh, Microsoft. Um, we wanted the seller to be highly skilled in data analytics um, slash modeling, uh, data management, and just sort of understand uh, our needs in terms of company and be able to um, promote, I guess, more efficiency. Uh, as a requirement of the tender, we, want, we wanted uh, to conduct a workshop to understand 
more about what we do as a department, the different data sources we had. Um, we conducted a data audit of all our data sources, determined a hierarchy of needs, uh, and then Agile went away and developed sort of a back end infrastructure plan outlining how we're going to go about um, ingesting all the different sort of data sources we had and then delivering through Power BI um, and dashboarding as well. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, we have a huge number of sort of data sources. Um, they range from arrivals data, so government um, official data, in terms of how many people are coming into the country. You can break this down by a whole different number of filters, sort of um, the age groups, um, uh, country of residence, country of citizenship. So, it's a really rich data source that we had to understand where people were coming from, uh, the trend over months, and yeah, it was. It, brilliant data source. Um, expenditure data was something that was collected by a, uh, another government agency called Tourism Research Australia. There are government agencies that um, conduct surveys at all international airports. Uh, they collect data on where an international visitor went while they visited Australia. So how much they spent in search certain regions, uh, what sort of accommodation uh, providers they stayed at, um, activities they did while they were at certain regions and, you know, just collecting a big range of data um, uh, for the international visitor. Um, during last year, we picked up a, uh, a search data um, by Skyscanner. So this gave us visibility in terms of what people were searching on a world-to-world -world basis. So they were able to understand, say, well, while the borders are closed to Australia, what's someone in Canada doing? Are they looking to travel in domestically? Um, is there still demand for all of that? So it gave us a good understanding of what's happening there. We also um, subscribed to a booking, a forward bookings data. So that's actually the conversion rate from search to bookings. We're able to see, well, if people were booked on a flight, we could see that data sort of, um, I guess, in real time. Uh, we also subscribed to an aviation data provider. As Australia is an island, the only way into the country really is by flight. So understanding what airlines are filing into their systems in terms of the number of seats or schedules or number of flights they're doing per day. That's something we really needed to know. Um, and then the lastly, sort of hotel performance data. So um, another company, third party company, provide, uh, we subscribed to their data. They collected a bunch of data from big hoteliers, um, which provided occupancy rates, um, how much they charge for rooms. So we can understand what's happening in our major cities and how they were hurting um, during the lockdown. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I'll just take you through, um, I guess, and as I mentioned before, we had so many different data sources and it wasn't really, I guess it wasn't our data. We subscribed to these data sources to provide us insights into what was happening in the market. So we had a big task for Agile to sort of, it wasn't just one source that they needed to understand. It was a range of sources that helped us, I guess, put all the puzzles together to understand what's happening within Australia, but then also what's happening globally. Um, one of our big research projects we call uh, the Consumer Demand Project. So it's a research project uh, conducted on behalf of Tourism Australia by a third party company, but they go out to uh, our 15 key markets. It's a survey, um, a panel survey. So it's understanding um, where, where these people are looking to go in the future. Have they been to Australia? What drew them to come to Australia? Um, and the, and the, so the data that came out of it was um, we had never really used in, um, ingested it in any sort of way. Um, previously, the company provided us insight through PowerPoint and which we converted to sort of infographics and insight documents that way. We were never able to really measure the changes between the different um, um, surveys from, I guess we went back, to, uh, it started in 2012. So we had this great, I guess, knowledge of historical data. We were never able to measure the changes against the years. So, I mean, that's something Agile helped us do. So uh, we worked with our third party company that did the research um, for us. Um, it, it, the, the original file came in a certain way that the, label, uh, the layout wasn't great for ingestion. We worked with that company along with Agile uh, to sort of prov uh, provide in a new format and new layout. And now it's just sort of automated into the ingestion and then we could see it in Power BI. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's just an example of what it looks like now. So we, it's just a data dump 
into our blob story storage, sorry, and then um, there's scheduled ingestions in the back end for Azure and a data warehouse that it sort of sits in there now. Um, and then we can pull out the insights very easily from all the different uh, uh, time periods and from our country of origin and things like that. Um, yeah, it's been a great tool. And then so Skyscanner. Skyscanner is a, a really good data set that I get, I get excited about. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we subscribed to Skyscanner data, I guess in the middle of last year to um, get a better understanding of what's happening on a world-to-world -world basis, but then as well domestically, what's, what's happening there. Um, the data file that was provided from Skyscanner is a daily file of all searches occurred worldwide. Um, so each row was one search and the information there ranged from your IP address. Um, um, so understand your location, what routes you were searching, um, uh, yeah, so just picked up a whole bunch of information. I guess we didn't really need um, the file. Each daily file was approximately 0.5 gigabytes, but that was during COVID. So um, we also got historic 2019 data just to be able to measure against a benchmark pre-COVID levels. And those files are about, I think, one gig uh, per day. So it's a huge data set that we were working with. Um, Pre-Agile, pre we, we were gathering some insights from it, from uh, the limited capacity of our team being able to work with those files. Um, but from working with Agile, they were able to aggregate the data into sort of four uh, separate Power BI reports. So we were able to look at Australia, Australia only. Uh, we were able to look at like weekly search levels uh, slash monthly search levels. Then we have a separate file for worldwide to Australia. So looking at understanding demand to Australia. Um, we also broke down the data into worldwide to worldwide. So on a country level, on a uh, country but weekly level, so understand what changes are happening um, um, worldwide. And then we also have a worldwide to worldwide monthly level. So due to the limitations of Power BI, we needed to break down uh, the data in that way in order to be able to visualize it. Um, and yeah, so it's, that's sort of what it looks like at the end of the day. Um, that's the Skyscanner weekly searches. And it's, um, I think that's the one that's, sorry, um, that's all the searches to Australia. Oh no, that's a domestic one. So we're able to break down by state levels as well. So Skyscanner provided data on an airport to airport. So if you're searching from Sydney to say Brisbane, it'll pick you up there and we could aggregate that data down to a state level to understand what demand for each um, state had when border closed, what was the huge impacts there. I mean, it was just a, a really good data set to see real time um, of what's happening within the industry. Thank you. Um, and then, so a third source we had was um, our expenditure data. So I mentioned before, Tourism Research Australia is a government agency that collects this data. Um, it's survey data, but not like the consumer research data, it's already been up factored. So each respondent has a weight against it. Um, each file was a text file that provided a filter against the main set of data. So I guess the relationship was quite complex. Um, I might go to the next slide and I can show you how each, oh, if you go back one, sorry. Oh my God, didn't... sorry, so that, that was it. Um, yeah. I think I've removed that, sorry. Uh, yeah, so each file um, worked as a filter um, to the main data set. So the relationship within Power BI was very complex because we needed to do um, filters included a huge range of things, whether the person was married, uh, whether they had a family. I mean, you could break down that information pretty much in which way you wanted to. Um, and that, that provided insight into where people were spending their money. So. Um, the IVS, which is the International Visitor Survey, was international visitors. And then there's also a National Visitor Survey, which is understanding domestic travel. Um, and we use those two data sets to understand, okay, the borders are closed now. Um, which regions are going to be hit the most without international visitors? And then a lot of our marketing within Tourism Australia could be adjusted in order to sort of fill those gaps. And that's how we sort of use those data there. If we just go to the next slide. And the last one, sort of just a summary. I mean, I guess the rest of our data sources um, uh, was in CSV files and Excel files. 
So we worked with Agile just in order, pretty much a data dump. I mean, every time we receive those files from our 30 provider, third party providers, we dump it into a blob storage location. Um, it has a scheduled load through into the data warehouse and then it refreshes into Power BI. So it's simple. I mean, it cuts down my manual time in terms of um, extracting that data into Excel, generating a PDF report. And then even within that, um, we were just getting a lot of ad hoc requests within the company. So understanding, I don't know, uh, what, what Sydney's impact of um, the borders closures domestic and internationally, like say we got those requests last year, this year, um, within Power BI now could just create a page and that would sort of just set and, and people could visit it on their own rather than me pulling the data repetitively. Um, I think that's it from me. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Seamus. Uh, so uh, this this slide's mine, but I, I'm sorry, Iman. I'm we're, I'm slightly conscious. Kane's actually um, got a family issue. Can we jump this slide and uh, maybe go a couple of slides forward? So you um, have control over this if you want to. Do I? Okay. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I will. Can I? Click on it. I don't think I can. Yeah, you're moving my mouse, but I don't know what to. Anyway, good. Is this? Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. So if you can just stay there. Kane, are you on the call? Yeah, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so um, design, Power BI, and DAX, we. Um, we followed a, a process uh, throughout the project where we um, we started each report uh, with mock-ups, exploring all sorts of different colours and layouts, uh, different title bars and page backgrounds. Um, and in the final designs, we ended up um, utilising one of the specific Tourism Australian colours for each report, um, which kind of lets users associate a particular colour with a particular data source and get used to that colour being that type of data that they're looking at. Um, we, we started with a requirements document that we filled out. Then we would uh, mock up quick PowerPoint mock-ups, uh, get feedback throughout the project. Whenever we hit milestones, we'd have re review meetings and review what was happening uh, in the reports. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess with the reports, there was, there was a lot of um, Excel examples. There was quite lengthy um, existing Power BI reports that we, that we needed to sort of look at. So I wanted to, um, to kind of condense it down, but still keep a lot of clarity. Um, so I think uh, we, we did a lot of grouping of visuals together to, to kind of um, make the pages clearer and more cohesive. Um, I think if you want to jump to the next slide, it might talk a bit more about some of the, oh, that's just some samples. You want to jump to the next slide? Yeah, so as I was saying, we wanted to, um, we wanted to condense the reports, but make them clearer and not just, um, you know, complex and overloaded with data. So uh, we utilised um, calculation groups a lot to uh, give users the ability to select different metrics uh, and save a bit of space that way and build in some more interactivity into the reports and, and give more, you know, Power BI capability to the, to the people using them. Uh, we also use them to um, help the clarity by uh, formatting the numbers using um, custom format strings and calculation groups. So letting us display thousands and millions next to each other, but without... Um, you know, uh, right next to each other with the right amount of decimal places and everything looking beautiful. And there was also some, some complex models with um, some of the survey data where we'd have um, multiple star schemas and multiple fact tables, uh, but there'd be like um, um, relationships between the, the fact tables as well, where it'd be like a, you know, a um, what do they call it, uh, detail line, you know, uh, like line detail for a fact table. So um, we didn't want to create relationships between fact tables, but we, we created inactive relationships and used calculation groups where necessary to kind of switch on those inactive relationships for calculations uh, across kind of report pages. Obviously with um, COVID, there was um, 
you know, quite a, a strong need um, for Tourism Australia to compare against 2019 and as we come out of COVID to keep comparing against 2019 um, to see how we're tracking against that. So we build a lot of custom time intelligence um, using, you know, year on 2019, but also giving um, users the ability to choose uh, what year they want their time intelligence to compare to. Um, one of the other requirements that was, you know, reasonably challenging was that there was a, um, the reporting requirement was to select a month year in the report and then to show the previous year from that month year selected. So rolling periods and be able to select any month year and all the axes and axiom um, numbers in the report would uh, show the previous year from that month. So we, we came up with a modeling solution to, um, to approach that, which was, which was successful. Uh, and then we found um, survey data was, you know, a lot of fun. There was um, a lot to explore and a lot of um, information. So um, throughout all the reports, we wanted to sort of give, you know, the approach of starting with top line numbers and overviews and letting people sort of naturally drill down into further and further detail as they needed. So um, we did that a lot with the surveys where we'd start top level and get you know, overviews and get more and more detailed throughout the reports. But uh, we also found, you know, decomposition trees for exploring survey data were just really cool for, especially when you get down to kind of the analyst sort of level of detail. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, that kind of, you know, high level to detail level kind of was across reports where we'd have navigation overview and, and sort of category detail, but it was also across pages where we'd kind of, took a kind of similar approach across the pages where we'd have uh, slices and total numbers and then we'd give tabular detail time series and then your, your category kind of breakdowns. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, actually, that's that's it for me. <laughs> so, but before, before Kane drops off, because he'll need to actually do that pretty soon, he's, uh, he's had a family emergency, he's still presenting. Um, any any questions for him, and then uh, we might we might jump back a couple of slides. No, no questions. No, we have two uh, tickets for maybe questions or answers, or maybe can if you have a question for uh, for anyone, <laughs> people can answer. There's one question down uh, from Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, that's uh, that's correct. So using a page level filter to apply like a, a bi-directional cross filter or, or just enable a relationship uh, across all the measures um, on a page. But there was also a requirement sometimes where, where we only needed to apply it to say like 70% of the things on the page. And so to do that, we do like a, I used a, just a hidden, um, a hidden slicer and then uh, you know, edited the interactions to apply to which visuals I wanted and then hid the slicer so that we could um, do it that way. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's, a, it's probably one of the most useful um, calculation groups uses out there, I think, using use relationship and cross filter and stuff like that, because you know, as you know, it's it's not good practice to enable um, bi-directional relationships um, or many-to-many -many things like that in your report. So to do it at calculation level, but, you know, it's a pain to write, you know, 30 different measures just for one page to, to enable a relationship for all your, your measures. So one calculation group in the uh, filter pane as a page level filter is uh, a good way to go. Any other questions for Kane? I'll, I'll, we'll allow one, one or two more. Here's one. Yeah, the rolling period concept. Yeah, so I generated a, um, well, firstly, I say that I came up with a solution and then I would say that um, after that solution came out, SQL BI put out an article with, with a, probably a more elegant solution than mine. But I think the, um, the rolling period was a good solution and it worked well. Uh, I generated a table, a date table that had um, used the generate function for each uh, month. I generated the period required to be filtered and then connected it as a filter to the date table through a bridging table. 
Uh, and then so, you know, basically when someone would select a month in the table that I generated, it would filter six months in the actual date table or 12 months or whatever the period needed to be. We did it with quarters and months. And the reason I say that it, it, the, the, the SQL BI solution may be slightly more elegant is that um, we had to use, it just makes, you have to add an extra remove filters into um, the calculations. Um, but without going too into depth, yeah, that's the idea behind it is, is creating a new table that drives a filter, filters um, your date table. Uh, was there some other questions there? You see, well, can there. you briefly explain the DAX formula, which was yeah, the rolling? Yeah, I know the rolling period is uh, is tricky. If you um, if your if your requirements are simple, and you just need to show numbers by a rolling period, then you can do like a you know a calculation group, and you can just um, uh, you can just force the filter in DAX. You know, you can you can say take the reference date of the slicer that's selected, the selected value of the slicer, and then in your DAX, you just, you know, write a, a dates in period, calculate with the dates in period using that reference date as a starting point. Uh, but if you need to use, um, to use, uh, you know, to filter axes of charts where you select a month and then you need to show a certain amount of months on the chart axis, then you can't really just do that and it becomes more complex and you need a model-driven uh, solution where you're, you know, uh, yeah, because you need a different filter on the, the axis, essentially. So um, there are different ways to do it. I would say, uh, you know, actually a colleague of mine, RTM, showed me a really cool way to do it with uh, top end filters, which is another way you can do it. Um, but look, I would say if you're interested in using rolling date periods, the best solution I've seen is the uh, SQL BI one, which I can probably drop a link to the page in the chat. And that's a modeling and um, modeling and calculation group solution. So I'll, I'll dump the link there. And yes, golden data set um, for measures. We did use a golden data set um, concept across the whole project. And uh, the uh, the external tool where you, what's it called? Um, let me find it here, it's here somewhere. External tool, yeah, the hot swap connections that uh, that thing is like, uh, a godsend. You need to have the hot swap connections external tool when you're working golden data sets on on lots of reports connected to models. It just makes life easy. So if you haven't got that, check it out for sure. Okay, I'm conscious of your time, Ken. I know you have to go elsewhere. Uh, we might we might stop questions for Ken at that point. If there are other ones, um, maybe uh, you could probably put them onto our LinkedIn page, and uh, we'll we'll have a a spot for Ken to kind of come back and respond to some of those as well as the wider team. We've got, we've got a few more that have come through. So um, yeah. if, if, if you want, um, Iman, I don't know if we can export the chat and then just get um, Kane to respond to them and maybe just as a blog post or something on our um, website. Sure, we'll do. Uh, can if you are like a, a quick answer to those, maybe you can do uh, How question. can we improve data storytelling from these dashboards or advanced analytics? Uh, well, you know, it's a, I think that's a long topic, how we can improve data storytelling. Um, Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, was this analysis services developed inside Power BI file or a zero AS tab of you? This was developed in Power BI file. So I had um, amazing data engineers like Chap who served me up beautiful data. And then we just um, connected it all up in a Power BI file, used that as the uh, golden data set, and then um, built our reports connected to that. And chat, chat's got uh, a, 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 a spot to talk through the, some of the stuff that he built. Um, was there any other questions? I, sorry, I can't see if there's any other ones. Kane, was, did you answer all of them? Um, I think so. I said we can do maybe later the straight filling and advanced analytics. If that's a bigger topic, we can discuss later. Excellent. All right. Sorry. Thank you very much, Kane. Hopefully everything's all right. Yep. No worries. Thank Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Um, Bye. Iman, sorry. Just if you want to jump forward. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch on this. Uh, obviously, 
uh, kind of hanging together this whole process was uh, a an agile framework for project management. Um, you know, some some basic concepts. Uh, so you know, obviously some of these are agile tenants. So people over process. You know, we um, we made sure that obviously the the way we uh, executed on the project focused on the business, focused on the customer, focused on you know interactions over anything else. Uh, and so you know, obviously if there was issues, we would use um, you know, uh, quickly jump onto a call to discuss those, you know, uh, we tried to kind of limit emails as much as possible if we could. Um, the second concept, so, you know, obviously the, the scope of this project was quite large. And so one of the things that we was important was to kind of keep uh, Seamus and, and Lauren, the other person on the project, uh, uh, in the driver's seat in terms of you know what's happening keep them informed on the latest and that that included everything you know from decision decisions and design decisions to uh things around the budget the scope etc so you know obviously that was a key point for us to make sure that uh what was getting delivered was actually you know going to meet their requirements um, and and the last point around right size governance was about um making sure that you know we had the right checks and balances in place from a, a project management perspective so you know, uh, daily standups. Uh, we originally had daily standups and we actually ended up falling back to twice a week checkpoints. One of them was actually a start of the week uh, stand up where we would actually just talk about, you know, what's the plan for the week uh, and actually uh, end of week close out where we we'd retro and uh, or review all the achievements, retro the actual process, plan uh, in a little bit more detail what we're actually gonna cover off for the following week. And, and also resource requirements that we would need from um, from the business, as well as actually cover off, you know, things like financials and stuff like that. Uh, and so in between that, you know, if, if a meeting needed to happen to actually workshop some of the requirements, or we needed to actually have an internal technical meeting to think about how we would actually deliver on some of those solutions, those were booked as required. Um, so that's key point on this slide. Uh, uh, if there's no questions, we'll jump to then chat. So chat's going to talk a little bit about the uh, the back end solution that was developed. Chat. Oh, awesome! Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I think um, thanks, Seamus. I think that was that was a, a lovely description of how how we approached the pain points and and uh, came to this solution architecture. I think the the main things that I'm going to talk about is how the thinking process of the proposed architecture came up. Uh, we had a couple of sessions with the with, uh, Tourism Australia IT team. And um, the decision was that, um, you know, they have a vision to go cloud first anyway. So that was the first approach. And then there are Microsoft House. So Azure Cloud is the first preference anyway. And we would prefer to, to go on that because we are Microsoft House as well. Uh, so that was the first decision. And the second one, like uh, Seamus was saying, there were so many different data sources, but the common fact among most of these data sources was they, they were text file dumps in some form. Some of them were semi-structured, some of them were structured. Uh, and, and also at the same time, there were a couple of API calls that we had to um, you know, do. That, that, uh, that second point that we were uh, looking into uh, for the architecture diagram design. And the third point was um, the project was pretty tightly, uh, you know, it's a limited number of days uh, allocated for the whole project. We had to think of uh, different ways to, you know, sort of reduce the time we spent on repeatable, you know, reuse, uh, repeatable tasks. So which um, we were able to do because we, we do have in Agile Analytics, we do have, uh, you know some components that we've already pre-built and tested on different clients anyway with frameworks and and you know, reusable components. So we make use we made use of those ones um, as as much as possible. And uh, you can go to the next one. Yeah. So thinking with all these things in in our head, and with the support of um, you know IT uh, tourism IT. Uh, we were able to uh, suggest a, or propose a, a solution on top of Azure Cloud. So if, from the diagram, you see, it's not a complex uh, diagram, but it, it is has heavily, like massively supports uh, the Tourism Australia IT, IT infrastructure uh, in terms of many aspects. Like it, it, uh, we, we've uh, catered 
as much as possible to save cost on 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 azure resources as at the same time uh, provide you know maximum capabilities on in, by increasing and decreasing the 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 you uh, the, the performance tires or pricing tires so most of the like shamus was saying before most of the blobs uh, more stx files were dumped onto blob storage except for the web apis and from blob storage um, we used the uh, the framework that i was saying uh, which was built on top of azure data factory so we pick up files from um, data blob storage uh, some of the files, like big, massive files, which uh, came through Sky Scanner, uh, were actually uh, done using Polybase uh, from Azure Blob Storage into uh, using Polybase. It was taken into Azure Synapse because we needed the the, um, the power of Synapse to process those massive, large files and aggregate them in a manner that can be absorbed uh, into Power BI. Uh, without exceeding the limit of Power BI. So we had to go through uh, you know, um, Polybase technology in, in Synops to aggregate them into weekly and monthly into different um, tables, partition tables. And then we absorb that into Power BI. Um, the rest of the data files um, through the data factory framework, which was completely metadata driven, um, uh, you know, repetitively extract each file, which is, it is differently scheduled. So some of the files um, comes in daily, some of the files comes in weekly, monthly, half yearly, and yearly. So, so we had to schedule the data factory components to pick up the files whenever that, that there's a file that um, you know lands on on Azure Blob Storage into a SQL data data SQL database, and finally ended up in in um, um in c uh in power bi so um azure logic apps is also used as part of the data factory framework to send email alerts on whether the the whole you know, etl successfully completed or, or not yeah um, so that's pretty much the architecture at a very high level there's a couple of questions for you chat maybe if you want to answer those and then we'll jump yeah on. definitely so the setup was configured to load external Excel or text files into blob storage automatically every day. So most of these um, uh, files, like Seamus was saying, um, they were external subscriptions. So um, some of the files were had to be downloaded by manually by um, Seamus and the team and, and copy them into blob storage. Um, whereas a web APIs were easily you know, extracted via the ADF. So most of the text files actually had to be copied into um, blob storage because they are not, you know, uh, customer side, they, they're not providers of text files uh, into blob storage. So we had to you know, manually subscription wise, like we had, had to copy them into blob storage in this, in this situation. Uh, did it really need Synapse to increase the cost? Look, we, we had to use Synapse because of uh, limitations in, in um, uh, Azure SQL database. Uh, it's not a limitation of SQL database, but SQL database size-wise, we had to keep it um, at, a, at a certain size so that we don't exceed the budget on SQL database side. But Synapse was, was already there and we use uh, post and, and resume capability of Synapse to um, you know, uh, reduce the cost, but at the same time, Synapse was uh, was using Polybase to uh, perform at a. We we increased that into a higher price uh, tire uh, for a shorter period. We process it, we uh, aggregate, and then we po uh, once it's it's uh, aggregated, we post the Synapse. So Synapse was the best option that we could go rather than getting them into SQL DB because we wanted to manage the SQL DB size as well. Uh, because we, if we if we put everything in SQL DB, SQL DB has to be uh, taken into the next pricing tier level. So we wanted to manage that as well. Um, did you... Lots of questions for your chat. Yeah, I'm just uh, reading through the questions. Could uh, you? The next is, do you have different environments dev test for? Uh, we have a dev and a test, uh, sorry, a dev and a prod, not a dev and a test and a prod because we wanted to, uh, you know, limit the uh, expense that was uh, put on top of uh, tourism. So we've tried to manage everything in, in dev, 
and then push it into product. And, and some of those questions, I think there was a question or uh, a point around, um, you know, how we would ingest those files or bring them in and uh, how we automate them. Some, some of those limitations were, were uh, cost related. So we yeah. had to restrict our solutions based on how much time we had as well. So, you know, that's why obviously we went with certain directions on design. Yeah, and, and there was a lot of other factors that, you know, that was discussed in workshops with IT. And we didn't go down the path of using Databricks because the in-house in -house skill set for Python and Databricks was not the best. So we, we wanted to, you know, keep it at, at a more a knowledge transferable level at the same time, easily manageable by the existing staff skill set. And so there was there were a lot of other different um, reasons behind the in architecture. Um, could you use Azure Functions or Power Automate to pick up files from subscriptions and place them in? Yes, you can do that, but it depends on the situation again. So if you are to use um, a Power F, like I said before, these were mostly subscription based and, and uh, Seamus and, and the other team members, they had to manually download some of these files anyway. The, the, the interfaces does not support, you know, that kind of um, extractions out. Of, out. Uh, did you consider utilizing Power Automate to automate copy third-party data files? Yeah, like I said, it's, it's, the, same, it's the same answer. Um, I think you missed one question, Chad. Did I? Uh, that was about the role of AES. Uh, in yeah, sorry. Look, uh, like I said, there's a dotted line in this uh, for AES. We we proposed AES if the time, uh, if the size exceeded uh, for Power BI to handle, uh, Azure Analysis Services was a proposal. So we did not go down that path. We just completely ignored Azure Analysis and we've tried to manage it at a data level rather than going down that path because that, that is expensive. Yeah, because I remember that was in the initial design yes. picture. Yes. But then, uh, I, I mean, the, the uh, Microsoft direction is also to uh, go with Power BI and even with a okay, premium if, uh, if we can instead of using. Yeah, so we system. had we had a constraint around that one as well, Iman. I think um, tourism is uh, is uh, pro. Shemis, is that right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, all pro licenses. Yeah, yeah. So we, we explored uh, premium and premium per user as an option, but um, at the time of the project, we we um, it, decision was made we wouldn't use that as an option. Yeah. So in this architecture solution, how is the monthly estimation for Azure resources roughly? If you um, so unfortunately. <laughs> I currently do not remember how much that was, but roughly I think um, for SQL database, I think I might have to go back to a tourism infrastructure uh, team to get these insights, but we did some estimates that was months back. So I, unfortunately I can't remember from the top of my head how much that was, but um, somewhere around maybe 3,000, 4,000. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, I might be wrong. I might be completely wrong. Yeah, because back to your point, it's not that it's 24 seven, uh, it goes yeah. you know, up and down and on and off uh, as we need. So that's exactly. A, uh, yeah, even the SQL database is, is, uh, is, a, is a serverless. So it, it, can, it, it just goes um, posts if, if it's not used. Multiple SQL DBs could be much lower cost often with Synapse people. Yeah, look, uh, again, yes, I agree. Um, I think, uh, like I said before, there was many different factors uh, to come up with this solution. Things that I may not have, you know, mentioned here, which we discussed in workshops. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we only had a few, uh, like a very short deadline to achieve all this. So during the period, uh, if the, the, the best solution that we could achieve is, is what we've done. So there may have been, so like there were some functions that was already written in Azure Synapse Analytics, which we could reuse. So that's one of the other options also, so which, which sort of us to go down that path and at the same time thinking of all these other things. I guess uh, that's because Greg Lowe, we all know him, uh, SQL done on the- yes. uh, yeah, I know. Master and uh, MVP. So, Greg, yeah. if you want to unmute and you can uh, maybe uh, 
uh, there are some uh, decision points and design principles yeah. that we uh, yeah. follow. That yeah, I could think be challenge um, and that could be absolutely yeah. right. Uh, yeah, I saw your yeah. name, Greg. I saw you've been. No, no, it's all good. I, I won't go on video tonight because I'm actually in hospital tonight, which is oh. a, a, a weird thing. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the no, I think the reason I was saying that is is that what I strike at sites that use uh, Synapse is they tend uh, to be very reticent to ever have like multiples of them because it costs so much. Um, yeah. and, and so they don't have good support for environments, for example, like they'll try and run dev and test and things all on the same machine as the production one, right? Yeah. Um, because it just doesn't lend itself well to that. Exactly. And, uh, and the same sort of uh, thing as well, I, I look at, uh, that's why I was wondering also how you're managing source code. Um, because yeah, again, you've got quite a mixture of things there, and I'm just like, what do you do with source? You know, because um, normally, if I had approached a project like that, we would have used multiple Azure SQL DBs. We would have scaled them as required, uh, used Azure Analysis Services, and just used live queries out of the pro licenses, given the fact you the number of users you've got. But anyway, yeah, that's the thing. But I was also yeah. interested just in what you did with yeah. source control. Yeah. Yeah, no fair point. Greg. I think um, uh, I think the uh, some of the Excel, uh, the the source data files were structured. Some of them were unstructured. The ones that came up from uh, uh, Sky Scanner was more structured, and and uh, we could easily use external tables in in Synops, uh, which was actually was already being used as such from the existing IT. Uh, team um, to support uh, Seamus's uh, requirements even we, before we started the project. So we actually uh, went down that path. One of the reasons is that uh, we, it's already been written and, and some of the store procs just needed a bit of change to perform uh, fine tune uh, the solution. And, and that actually saved us some time from the project rather than starting that from scratch. And the source code was actually a so database is a database project uh, chucked into a visual um, sorry um, DevOps and and ADF is also in DevOps so everything's in DevOps. Well, are we in IDG at, uh, to Azure DevOps or we use just different workspaces and the deployment pipelines? Yeah, so uh, uh, we use uh, we use different repositories for the Azure Data Factory and different repositories for database projects within the same DevOps project. Okay, but nothing for Power API yeah, because there was no premium. Uh, yeah. We just use different workspaces, right? Yeah. Okay. There's one more question for you, Chad. Is there a backlog? Backlog with- Multiple yeah. Seamus, uh, is there a backlog left with Tourism IT? I might be able to answer. Yeah, what sort of backlog? To consider so it might be a question for technical debt or something that you can do when the time and fund, uh, funds permit, what does it include? That's a question. I don't know if that's technical debt or that's more in the functional. So Andrew, do you want to elaborate on that, please? If you want to unmute. Yeah, hi guys. I, I guess I, I sort of got the sense that because it had to be turned around quickly and there were limited funds, you couldn't do everything that you might have suggested to, to tourism. So like we were talking earlier about automating, getting the files in from the third party services and, and other bits and pieces. So I, I imagine a typical project like this, you say, look, if we had more time, if we had more funds, we would do this, but we'll leave it with you. Um, yeah, you, you guys can take it up at a, at a later time if it, if it suits. So was, was there sort of a few of those things that tourism now has to, to think over? Yeah, yeah, there was. So I can probably answer that a little bit. And Seamus um, probably uh, definitely has a view. Uh, so, it, you know, a couple of things that originally were in the scope were, for example, um, including a ability to have commentary functionality within the reports themselves. So actually um, not, not the commentary functionality that's in bu built into Power BI or, you know, Power BI and Teams, but actually, you know, like you would see in an executive report, actually the, the commentary associated to the visual that's on there. Um, so that that was the scope from the project. And um, not to say that we would never pick it up, but we actually ended up saying, let's let's deliver the actual um, uh, ma main parts of the project, where, where the actual most of the benefit is. And 
back to the project goals, what's actually the key things that need to be delivered and all those items, you know, if we still got budget left, we'll, we'll revisit um, that particular item. I think we've got an actual session on it to talk about it tomorrow um, to talk about some options in terms of how we deploy something like that. Um, but there was a couple of examples where we, we didn't end up actually delivering that solution. Another example was obviously what, what chat mentioned before around, you know, an end to end uh, automation solution to actually pulling the file as well. So that part of, the, again, the, the, um, the process, you know, said, uh, we, we ended up saying, okay, well, what's the actual benefit? How much, how much more benefit is actually adding, adding versus the cost that might uh, be required to kind of pull that uh, extra piece of information in? Um, again, uh, decision at the time was to de-scope it and to revisit it if, if we needed to. Seamus, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, there was just a, a couple of small, I mean, admin issues, I guess, such as like, ultimately say a country list we would like to have sort of regions associated to that so say with the sky scanner if we wanted to uh, have sub regions like uh southeast asia northeast asia um that's probably something we'll include uh, later on um if we have budget but just more details like that to be able to split re countries into regions to be able to aggregate say search levels or booking levels um across multiple data sources to be consistent um yeah, that's something we'd probably look at in the future, just optimizing the data, I guess, and optimizing the reports. Um, and then there's also, I think, something we need to look at with the Skyscanner country to country level uh, data, because that's about to exceed uh, Power BI's capabilities. So that's something we would need to look at in the future. Um, yeah. Probably the two things I can think of, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh... This, we still have a, a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to ask you a challenging question. I don't know who wants to answer. Uh, what would you do differently if you were going to start this project again? What are the things that you think could have been done? I feel like I've got a slide for that, but let, let's, can you just jump to that last slide for me, Iman? Oh, for you. Okay. It, might, it might be a summary. Um, That's a summary. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, maybe, uh, Seamus, if you want to start, start with that, that question. Yeah. So, um, I think it's more of a personal thing or like a, a team thing. So my experience isn't in the back end. I can admittedly say that, like, I don't know the IT, uh, details of the architecture and what all of the processes are. Um, I've mainly worked in Excel and any work I've done in Power BI is directly pointed to Excel. So we've had no databases in the past, in my team anyway. So I guess if I was to restart the project, it was it would be to bring on, either get a better understanding of the back end, because there's a lot of delays that happened on our side, at TA side, having to bring in the IT team last minute because uh, Agile needed approval um, in certain areas or bring in the IT teams because you need a device that we weren't really skilled in that area. So we didn't know whether, I guess the architecture was something that would be used long-term or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think just that, that sort of area that, you know, if I did this project again, it would be educate myself or bring on someone who knew that from our side anyway. Chat, would you, what would you say? Sorry, I may have missed the whole question. Now. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, anything you do differently? Uh, uh, look, um, I think uh, what Greg was mentioning uh, that's something that um, I would also think about uh, rather than uh, having the synopsis. Because if I had the time, if we had the time to go back and and, and you know do all those uh, store talks and that was using synopsis, that's something that we could potentially you know spend more time and then and and then do on on SQL side itself so that that can you know that um, TA can save a bit more time a uh, bit more money on, on that but again then again going back it's it's the time that has to be spent on on creating those ones but in the long run it will save the money we, we, we may have Nick on the call from Microsoft Account Manager on this. Uh, you may not, <laughs> you, we need to uh, take this part out. Uh, so 
Microsoft may not like this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Censored. Yeah, exactly. All right. Good, good. Uh, Look, I so, think at the end of the day, it, it's visual anyway. So every okay. resource that we use. End of the day is what's best for customer and exactly. you know how much we can save on the license and cost, ongoing cost. For yeah, us. I think that's the, yeah, exactly. And, and that's the Microsoft vision anyway. So to support customers, to save money at the same time, do the things better, how they are currently. Not just going with their nice, shiny new tool that is there. True. So something exactly. that is fit for purpose, absolutely. As you exactly. said, I, I agree with the way. Okay. Uh, Matt, are you still there? Matt Addington? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, excellent. Uh, I think we are almost at the end of this. Uh, I don't know, Matt Salmon, so have you got anything else or that, that's end of you? No, that's it. That's it from us. Uh, I mean, this slide is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but, you know, obviously, I think um, maybe a learning, learning for me or something I do differently, I think... Um, uh, Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, I think, you know, sometimes, sometimes when you're in a project and it's large and complex, um, it, it's, um, you know, there's a tendency to kind of say, we'll go agile. Um, but sometimes you actually need to kind of uh, spend a bit more time on the problem and think about, I guess, um, you know, what, what that end state is going to look like and, you know, design with, with, um, with some of those considerations in mind, I think, you know, we, we, there was a, a couple of points in the project where, you know, we, um, we would run into kind of issues and we'd have to kind of deal with them as, as we went. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fine line. I think sometimes, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, you can spend a lot of time trying to analyze things and not get a lot done. So, you know, uh, it's a um, two, two sided uh, equation. So sometimes, yeah, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of thinking out loud. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. I, I think uh, chat, you can answer them later. Uh, and we uh, have two free tickets that we haven't decided yet. Do you guys want to just pick one person or we just randomly uh, maybe do it or later? So I'm asking you guys maybe. May maybe, a, maybe a draw. Can I suggest a draw, Iman? Uh, right now or after this? No, oh, well, perhaps afterwards, yeah. So every, everyone that's registered, just do a draw. And... Anyway, that's my suggestion. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Unless there's anyone here who can attend the training next, I believe, Thursday, 26th, then we can maybe just give it to the first two who said yes. <laughs> Let me just make sure the date is correct. Uh, that's... That was in my first slide here. Yeah, yeah that's uh, yeah. just just do it as a draw. Okay, brilliant. Excellent. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so Iman and I will put our secret selection panel hats on and come back to in the next couple of weeks with what our plan is for the next month. Um, thanks a lot to the team from Tourism Australia for an excellent presentation. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you all again uh, in about a month's time from now, probably online again, I'm sure. So we'll see you all then. Thank Thanks you very much. Guys. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks, guys.